Welcome to the Turning Stone Show, where we discuss topics of the human experience. We're here to offer conversation, ask questions, and explore. We invite you to join with us on this journey in the discovery of purpose in life. I'm David Marsh, and here with me, as always, is Jesse Farrell and Justin Maman. Today, our topic is God, Ego, and Authority, the Social Origins of Religion. Our special guest is Barbara Mays. She's the author of the soon-to-be-released book, Seasons of Loss, A Walk in the Soul Garden. Barbara was in a religious cult for 22 years. Justin was raised in a conservative Jewish home. Jesse was born into a religious cult as the child of Barbara. And I was raised as a fundamental Christian in a white American household taught to believe that Jesus was my substitutionary atonement that would allow me to be accepted by God. And if I didn't accept his sacrifice, I would burn in conscious eternal torment. We've put together a short video piece to start this conversation. Religion speaks in many tongues. Its main purpose is to teach the young that all should succumb to a higher power and follow good rules hour by hour. Uniting in purpose can be a beautiful thing, but individuals must remember to be accounting to their true values built in when they're born and minding their actions when decisions are torn. Even though a religious belief may be true, it's interpreted by a human, not necessarily you. So make sure next time you act in good faith, you have checked with your own values and asked if it's safe. The Social Origins of Religion. Barbara, you were in a cult for 22 years. Share with us your experience. At some point you were a young person, you were persuaded. Walk us through that journey. Okay. Well, I was raised in Christianity and not just Christianity. I, I, I see Christianity in the spectrum of a pole. Uh, Pentecostalism being at one end of the pole and Catholicism <laughs> being at the other end of yeah. the pole. Uh. And so I was at the Pentecostal end of the pole. In a fringe Christian group already, I was uh, reluctant to even let people know what fringe group I was from because everybody made fun of the, the holy rollers and you know the people that spoke in tongues and all of that. So it was a while. I was into my mid-teens before I was okay with standing out and saying, I, this is where I'm from. I'm from, you know, a Pentecostal group in town, and I was okay with that. And I began to, at that point, I think really identify with my Christianity. As time went on, it, it was in the 1960s, and in the 1960s, uh, the entire world was changing. There was this movement globally, uh, and in the 60s generation here in the United States, epitomized a great deal of what that movement was about. Uh, down with organiz organizations, uh, down with everything that's uh, always has been and let's you know just crash through that and create something new and different. So everyone was looking for reality. I think the the feeling was is that all of the organized anything had gotten stuck and that it had gone as far as it could go and there was no life to it. The hippies generation, flower power, uh, free love, uh, you know, down with anything that was organized. And religion was among all of that. My parents were introduced to a group uh, that was an international group, and it was beginning to call upon all people within the Christian segment of the religion, or of religions within Christianity, to come together and form a fellowship. And outside of that fellowship, uh, from one of the speakers that came to that fellowship, my parents were very intrigued with what he had to say. And we began to follow that group. And eventually it came to be known loosely as the MOVE, or the Movement of God, 
And if you Google it online, it will even say uh, Fifeites because Sam Fife was the founder of the MOOC. What we were looking for, what Sam Fife was looking for, was a restoration of the things that he saw biblically in the early church. So he was looking to renew and to restore what the early church looked like. We began uh, gathering together outside of churches and we began to gather in homes. Eventually we grew big enough that we gathered together in warehouses and any place that would rent to us. And I remember that the very first time I heard the sermon about going to the wilderness. And it was taken from the uh, scriptural reference in Revelation that in the end times, God was going to pour his wrath out upon all of humanity. Well, also in that same segment of scripture, it talks about an elite group called the man-child. Uh, company that is being uh, taken to a wilderness place and hidden for a time and a time and a half time. And so we believed that we were that elite group and that we were going to skip all of the wrath that God was going to pour out on humanity. So a lot of us began to go to wilderness places and different farms and communes and <clears throat> communities were being formed all the way from Alaska, all across Canada, even some here in the United States in more wilderness places, and in Columbia, South America. Our family went to Columbia, South America, and we lived there for three years in community. And we had just gotten there, we hadn't even been there an entire month, until the radio operator who communicated back in the States every day got the news that there was now a satellite in the sky that could read our name tags. I remember feeling totally betrayed. <laughs> it was like, okay, there's no place on the planet that you can hide, and so why are we here hiding out when God's wrath is going to be poured out on the entire world when, in fact, we're not hidden at all. We can be seen from the sky. And that began my journey, in my serious journey on questioning uh, my religious path. I, it took me a long time before I ever took action on that, but I was considered a rebel. I asked way too many questions. Yeah. <laughs> so I did, you know, I did that. It, it, it was a long time, but um, it actually took many years later getting the news when we were living on one of this, those communities in Minnesota, on a little farm in Minnesota, that one of the children, a, a grown child of one of the elders in this movement had stepped into the middle of that compound and blown his head off. I remember thinking, this is just an experiment. <laughs> wow. We're just experimenting to see if this works. Yeah. And it had already been evident that as soon as children reach the age of emancipation, which I guarantee you every child in the move knew what the legal age of emancipation was in the state where they lived. Mm. And children, as soon as they reached that age, they were leaving by the droves. Yeah. And I remember thinking, I'm, I'm not willing to participate in this experiment anymore. So we, we did, we left, mm -hmm. and so that was the beginning of my journey on my own yeah. spiritual path. I, I noticed that in your religious context, uh, you were given a narrative that was maybe controlling by fear. Very much. You were told that you were separate, and you were also told that you were superior. Mm -hmm. I've experienced those th same things with my uh, faith journey. And now, I didn't feel like I was in a cult where I was isolated or separated. I was in a fundamental or evangelical, go out and share the good news church. But the same teaching is you're controlled by fear because you have conscious eternal torment, because you'll be unworthy to be, stand before a holy God. Two, if you do what we say and you say the prayer that we say, you'll be safe and secure. 
and you'll be separate from everyone else. The sheep will be separate from the goats. And my awakening has occurred uh, recently and rapidly where I realized there's a connectivity between all of us after having read thousands of near-death experiences I realize there is a purpose, a source, there is a love, there is a peace, there is a connection, there's a lot grander scheme going on here than I was given as a narrative which led me to continue to grow and journey and search and just enjoy the process of waking up. And Jesse has been a large factor in that. I give you gratitude. I've enjoyed Justin's contribution and sharing his perspective with my journey and my growth. And uh, it's, it's been a process and I've enjoyed it. Justin, share with us your perspective on this. Yeah, there's definitely a common thread. <laughs> um, and I think, I think Dave illustrated it pretty well. I grew up in a conservative Jewish family. I was born in Israel. Similarly to Dave, there was nothing extraordinary about being Jewish in Israel because, interestingly enough, Israel was formed as a political and religious state, which is kind of an interesting combination. The formation of Israel also involved, um, you know, kind of a post, post-World War II safe haven for the Jewish people. So there's this high-level view of Judaism being the origin of the Abrahamic religions. The entire basis for all Christian and Muslim doctrine is that um, the Jewish people and the, and the history of the Jewish people and the um, divine relationship between God and the Jewish people and the history and the story of the Bible all of that is the basis for the continuation of that story into Christianity and Islam. So in that sense, it's kind of fascinating how the whole world, the three largest religions in the world, are connected by this one story. Mm -hmm. And here I am in this modern day time representing, I think, like less than 1% of the world's entire population. It's like 0.2%. And yet, the fact that I'm Jewish is significant in some larger way than that 0.2% of the population that I represent. So the Jews as a, as, a, as a people have a consciousness, have a history that is based in victim consciousness. It's kind of openly talked about that the Jews' entire history is based in persecution. From the biblical stories to modern persecution, it's the basis of our identity as a people is that we stick together as a tribe. We're not an evangelical religion. We do not try to recruit people into our religion, so we stay small in numbers relatively. And we uh, have to maintain that integrity of our people by remaining distinctly unique through our rituals and our practices and our, the most important thing, our covenant with God. Mm -hmm. Now, all of that sounds really great, but when you look at it from a social perspective, it's like, okay, well, think about social groups, right? If I was sitting here with the, with the three of you and I said, hey, guys, I know that God created all of us. And he loves us all. But I, I have a special relationship with God that you guys just don't have. Mm -hmm. awesome. Don't feel bad about it. Yeah. It's not any slight to you. I didn't even decide. God did. Mm -hmm. Right? So there's, there's an element to being Jewish of being like a, the favorite child of God. Yeah. If you're in a family and there's a bunch of children, yeah. and the parent has a favorite child, everyone hates the favorite child. Yeah. <laughs> but Jesus loves all the little children of the yeah. world. Right? Well, That's what the I know you me. feel special, but because Jesus came and he was the Messiah, <laughs> you're not special anymore. Now, I'm special because I said the prayer that right. gets me into heaven. I get to live in conscious or in, in paradise while you're in conscious <clears throat> eternal torment because you didn't accept 
the word. So it's the common thread. What are you going to do? The, and so this is why our show is titled God, Authority, and Ego. Because the ego part of it is that the common thread in every religion is essentially, or at least in every theistic religion, um, is that there is a supernatural God, creator, father, usually, um, because most of those religions yeah. were born out of patriarchal culture. Yep. So they assigned, they projected their culture onto God. Yep. And, um, and that there is a divine privilege in belonging to that religion and that all other religions are false because in order for one religion to be true there has to be a there has to be a counterbalancing false yeah. religion it's the exclusivity it's the exclusivity it's getting into the vip club so as a kid like barbara i asked questions i'm like this makes no sense we live in a world where there's all of these people interconnected coexisting together and aside from our claim to this i don't see any evidence that i'm superior to anybody else other than that i believe so mm -hmm. and then what does that do to my relationship with others socially our desire is to belong and so if i want to belong to the greater human community then I don't feel like I can really do that because I've already distinguished myself as being superior and I can't, I can't belong if I'm superior. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the same time, if I want to belong to the Jewish community, which is my family, my neighbors, so forth, then I have to adhere to this belief. And so it's, it, it presented a conflict for me. And especially if you start asking these questions and talking about it philosophically and really using the, cr the critically thinking mind that we're blessed with, then you're usually called a self-hating Jew. Um, you know, you're shamed basically for critically thinking. And that is also the closed end loop that I think all religions create is that... Um, I even experienced this later on when I explored kind of more of a new age spiritual culture is that critical thinking was really looked down upon. That if you ask questions, people would say, oh, you're thinking too much. Oh, you're, you're analyzing this too much. Oh, well, you're telling, mm -hmm. you're believing in this mythical story that you have no evidential basis for. Like, you apply that same critical thinking to all other aspects of your life, why wouldn't you apply it to this? Makes no sense. So, I mean, my journey, I, it, my journey goes from that to at 16, very close friend who was, whose mom was Pentecostal Christian. Um, she was Peruvian. And at the time I was going through, um, at that age, I was going through a lot of conflict with my father and at home there was a lot of conflict and so I found a haven in that friend's home and that friend's mom welcomed me she empathized with me she acknowledged my suffering in the context of of her religious values and beliefs and I started finding a lot of comfort in going to church with her mm -hmm. um, so I actually for that year in high school I was like 15 actually, it's my sophomore year, I uh, converted to Pentecostal Christianity. People were speaking in tongues and I'm like, oh, this is the kind of mystical stuff I like, you know? <laughs> but I was like really young, so it just felt like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm, I'm finally breaking out of this box that I've been in my whole life. Mm -hmm. And then I realized all of this shit is crazy. <laughs> my parents found out. I went to church one night in secret mm. and I came, I came home, my dad was waiting in the driveway, furious. Mm. After that they brought a rabbi as like an intervention like to try it, right? So I went through this whole experience and, um, and finally I came to terms like I was really having um, like some peak spiritual experiences. They were not specific to any doctrine, I just had a yearning 
to, uh, you know, I'm kind of naturally a mystic by nature. Like I, I'm intuitive, I, I'm very sensitive, and I, I was yearning for that real spiritual connection to all of existence. And I needed a pathway for that, and I wasn't receiving that at home. So I received it in, Christ, in, in that Christian context. But through that journey, I mean, at this point now, I find it really difficult to identify with any particular religion. Jesse, give us your perspective. You've walked through the journey where you've been in a strong religious context to where you've put that behind you and you've been seeking uh, the mystical, you've been seeking the transcendent experience, that touch of spirit within you with the divine, but not in a traditional sense of going to a, a house of worship, but more on a journey through spirituality. Share with us your, your journey. I would say my first kind of thinking about something's off here was when I was a teenager and remembering that at that time the world was coming to an end um, about the year after I graduated from high school. Yeah. So there was no real does that concern. Correspond with, does that correspond with the book that was 88 Reasons Why the World Would Be Ended and in, in Jesus Would Come Back in 88? I mean, I remember that. Yeah, so. and so I put no thought or concern into what my future looked like. I'm like, I don't need to worry about preparing for college or going to college. It's like, why do any of that? The world's coming to an end in a year or so. So that was it. Yeah. So I didn't even think it. And then when that came and went, I'm like, well, now what? And so I think it began, and then I think it was, you know, about that time I got married, and then I just started noticing my own energy and sensitivity and noticing, like, I would think something. Actually, I would notice that I would, not I would see something, and then I would remember that six months ago or so I had thought that. Like, I started noticing my own manifestation and the power of, of my own being, power as a human being. And then it wasn't really until, I've, I think as I've shared before in another episode, where I had, was going through my divorce, I had no money, no food, no furniture, kids were coming over for the weekend, and when I went to my church and asked for either you know, $50 for money or a bag of groceries, and was denied both uh, for being gay. And I just remember, okay, this is not what I know inside love is, or what I grew up thinking God's love is. And that was just the switch and the turning point for me to begin to really explore what is, what's the purpose. I think when you begin to engage in those questions, which is what the show is all about, is questions and questioning, yeah. is when you begin to ask those questions, you are going to be given an answer from yeah. the universe. And so noticing what questions are you asking? And and then, also for myself, being willing to surrender to what the answer is yeah. and discerning the answer, not questioning the answer, so you can begin to take the next step. And oftentimes we don't hear it the first time or the second time or the third time, especially when we first, I think, start that awakening. And it's over a series of times that we keep making the same mistakes that we begin to, oh, okay, hear and listen to that voice and begin to make some different begin making different choices and that was where for myself where i really began then that period of time where it was i noticed it was six months of me saying thinking saying and manifesting something really began to shorten up and then just trusting each i've talked a lot about that just trusting how do you feel what am i noticing inside does it feel good does it not feel good and then just choosing from there, like what works. Yeah, that is great. Uh, I feel like that connection with the divine, I have experienced more as I've had a deconstruction of my fundamentalism and a reconstruction of spirituality. I feel like I have more of a connection with divine direction. Um, I feel like there's more synchronicity in my life. Things are happening, and when I'm more aware of them, it might be a song on the radio, it might be a movie, it might be a conversation I have with something. I'll hear things come around two or three different times. It's the same word. The word archetype is something mm -hmm. that recently has been coming around to me. I keep hearing people yeah. talking about this. and Deprogramming. This shift in consciousness. Uh, I really feel that uh, now that I've laid down the need for my ego 
to be uh, satiated by security and safety and superiority, when I've laid that down and I realize there's an interconnectivity for everything in all of life, I have a greater sense of empathy, I have a greater sense of love. When I see someone, I don't think, well, they're just going to go to hell, so why bother trying to help them out? I think, no, we're spiritually connected to all things, and it's important for me to help out. It's made me more socially conscious. It's made me more aware of what I eat, how I treat the environment, how I treat people. And I think it's important for us to understand that that ego that we have, once we learn that it's a tool to balance and it doesn't need to run our entire lives uh, it, it for me personally it's helped me move forward it's also interesting as so as you're talking about that like noticing the further you go along in that journey that you allow others to be at whatever place they are in their own journey and realizing Beautiful. that the more we give our opinions and this is the way it has to be we've talked a lot like socially, yes. like how much politics so and things like that are, is that those are all coming from fear and judgment. And the more we can practice recognizing and being conscious of everyone is on their own journey, yes. dealing with whatever their experience Beautiful. is based on what does their soul need in this moment of time yes. to be fulfilled in this lifetime. And that's going to change from moment to moment as well as person to person and experiences and cultures and different things like that. That's why you were born in America and you weren't born in India. Otherwise, yep. we'd be having a completely different conversation. You Agreed. chose to be born here to experience being a white male Christian instead of being born in India to be raised very, very different than yep. you are raised here. Yep. And so it, it allows us to give space for, and empathy for, and compassion for where everyone is in their own journey and at the same time I think recognizing that connection that we all have and then coming from a place of love, noticing that we are all connected. How can I support you in your journey? How yeah. can I make a difference for you rather than mm -hmm. rather than forcing it upon yeah. you, um, just you yeah. know, allowing well, that space well, of love? Uh, Through fear, I have to tell everyone, I, I know the way, the truth, and uh, you have to listen to me versus your experience of like, don't tell anybody, we're just our own tribe. Yeah. Well, I, I feel like there's part of the show title and part of this topic revolves around the social origins of religion. So we can talk about religion as a set of doctrines. We can talk about it in the context of being um, divine communication from God or divine order. And then I think the most interesting way to think about religion is as a social hierarchy or social order and how that affects us socially. One of the things that you notice about human beings is that we are social creatures, we function in social hierarchies, and we, whether we admit it to ourselves or not, we need, uh, we need authority, different levels of authority within our society in order to feel secure. Children need parents that are authoritative, that are firm, that are leading them. They need to trust that their parents are, are um, effective leaders and they need to trust what their parents do. And there's a sense of security in submitting to our parents' authority when we're younger. Um, there's that same sense of security when you have a boss at work and you know that boss has your back that you can focus on what you're focusing on on your path or whatever your job is and that that boss is overseeing everything and making sure that the full operation is functioning properly. So there's a sense of comfort, safety, security in knowing that we have trustworthy authority figures in our lives. And what's interesting about the human relationship to God, we also realize how vulnerable we are both individually and collectively, and there's a sense of, oh crap, who's, who's watching over this whole thing? Yeah. <laughs> like, and so it seems like a really natural form of hierarchy, the ultimate subordination where we submit to God. It's like the ultimate surrender of saying, you know what, my perspective is limited, our perspective is limited, and there are obviously forces in the universe that are beyond our conception, 
And it's totally natural to want to take that off our shoulders because we can't possibly keep that on our shoulders. And so we surrender to that. And that is the beauty of the human relationship to God and the divine. Um, it's, our humi- it's, it's, it's from a sense of humility that we can do that, that we're able to surrender that way. However, there's, like, as with any authority in any hierarchy, there's abuse of power, there's, there's conflicts of interest, there's vying for power, authority figures within the social institutions that are religions abuse their power um, and we blame the religion for it or we say that God doesn't exist because of it or we um, throw out the baby with the bathwater. And I think that it's really important to understand the social components of religion so that way we can see beyond them and still maintain a connection to the divine instead of just throwing it all out. That's mm-hmm. great. Uh, I'd like to hear, yeah. based on kind of some of the information we've had, so what, what's your, what would you like to add to that? And what's, well, I was just your, thinking... You've had a lot of history and yeah. research around religion. And, yeah, I was just uh, I was listening to the word intuition, the word authority, <laughs> uh, submission to God, all of that. And I was, I was thinking, even after I left the movement, it was a long time before I left religion because it was all I knew. You know, I, you know, you want to feel, you know, you want to feel like you belong. Yeah. And so I, I went back to Pentecostalism and I stayed in that for a few more years. And I think it's because our spirit is yearning to grow beyond that. But we will just stay in the nest for as long as uh, we can yeah. because it's safe there. Yeah. Yeah. And we're a little afraid to jump out of the nest mm. because we don't really, it's unknown. We don't know. We don't know anything except just what we've experienced. Yeah. And that's all we know to relate to. So as the universe would have it, because my heart actually was crying out, get me out of here. Mm. <laughs> There's got to be more. Yeah. And so, as the universe, you know, was meeting that need that I had. And the question that you were putting out there. And the question I was putting out there. I have had my final bad experience within religion. And it was, it was so horrendous. It was supposed to be in a counseling session. And I felt so violated in that counseling session through a prayer that was supposed to cleanse me of all the stuff from my past. At the end of that, the counselor said, well, that's the end of this session, you know, you can set an appointment to come back for the next session. And I said, I'll call you. Yeah. I walked out the door. I got into my car. I was in Minnesota. It was snowing. It was cold in my car. It was a little Dodge Neon car, a little tiny car. And I was just screaming at the top of my lungs. God if I have to know you through religion, guess what? <laughs> not going to happen because yeah. I'm not going back. You know what Shekinah means. The Shekinah glory would come once a year and indwell into the Holy of Holies. Okay. So this was the Shekinah glory of God. And if, and if the high priest didn't do all the right things, Going into the Holy of Holies, they always had a rope tied around his ankle. They could pull him out if, if he dropped dead because he hadn't done everything right. Well, here I am. I'm in this little car, and I, I just made this statement, you know, to God. You know, I'm, I'm not finding you. If I have to do it through religion, that's not happening, ever. And I felt that Shekinah just go whoosh and fill this little tiny car. Every hair on my body stood up. Oh, wow. It was kind of like, God. (laughs) (laughs) And I just heard, you know, just in my mind, that's good. That's good. Yes. And I was so excited that that was such a huge moment for me and that whatever God is, was right there yeah. and heard that conversation. The very next day, I went to the, li- to the public library <laughs> and checked out 26 books 
on the origins of religions, all oh, religions. Fascinating. I came home that afternoon with all of those books, and as my, as my custom within Christianity and all religions, I laid my hands on those books and I prayed. And I said, God, I'm not seeking to disprove you. I'm seeking to find you. Yeah, understand. Outside of what man says you are. Who are you? What are you? Show your face to me. And I saw a vision. Now it was one of these technicolor visions, so <laughs> it was kind of like on a TV screen. So I really recognized it as a vision, but I came to realize later I'd been having them all along. Mm. And I had this vision and I saw the scene from The Wizard of Oz where they're all standing in front of the big head the first time. And Toto, he's not afraid, so he goes and he pulls the curtain back and there's this little old man and he's cranking out this image, the head. Mm. And I waited and I didn't see anything else and I, I said, is that it? That was it. Well, what does it mean? And I just began to understand that the little old man was every culture from the time man has stood upright, looked up in the sky, or saw a storm, or saw some natural phenomena and said, I wonder if there's something more than just me out there. From that moment, man began to search for God. Mm -hmm. and, and every little tiny minuscule glimpse of the infinity of God that they got <laughs> the head. Yeah. This is it. This is God. Worship it. Right. And time would pass. And some people would say, I think there's got to be more. I'm going to go look outside the box. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't do that. It's, you know, you don't know what's out there. You might get lost and never find your way back. Yeah. But a few, and some people would say, okay. And some people would say, nah, I just got to go see. Yeah. And went outside the box and saw a few more yeah. minuscule <laughs> glimpses of the infinity. Yeah. The head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is God. Worship it. It's more than the other guy's God. Yeah. On and on and on. And in that moment, I realized religion wasn't, it wasn't like evil. They were searching for God. Yeah. But they only saw such tiny glimpses of yeah. the infinity. Yeah. So I started reading these books. And in the very first book I read, I began to realize that maybe, just maybe, this lifetime is not it. Maybe there's more. Maybe I always have been. Maybe I never will not be. Wow. And once my mind opened to that, that this, we don't just have this little tiny lifetime to get it right or yeah. you know, yep. that I really began to open my heart and mind to God explaining to me, hmm. you know, that face of God. And it has been an exciting journey just totally opening up, you know, that intuition of just, uh, and speaking and knowing the right questions to ask, just getting so excited when the answer starts coming because yeah. then you realize God isn't just this man with a long white beard that sits up there that's always judging me. I don't know what God is, but it's intimate. Yeah. It knows me. It answers me. That's great. God answers me. Yeah. I like to think of a uh, human being or a bunch of people sitting in a theater watching uh, a play, right? So you arrive at the theater, you know that there's going to be a show, and you're anticipating the show. And all you see is a stage and a curtain. And you're sitting there, the curtain comes up, and the stage fills with characters, and then the story begins. And when you're there in your seat, you want to experience the show as if it's really happening. You, the last thing you want to think about is like how, the, how it's being directed, 
or the or the cast or the script or whatever you're just watching the show you want to be entertained by it but somewhere in the back of your mind you know there's activity going on behind the curtains and you know that that's what's giving life to the show right but in order for you to enjoy the show you can't really go you you're, you don't want to allow your your imagination to go there because you're like, no, that's going to take away from the like visceral experience of being there at the show. And I feel like that's kind of, kind of how we experience life. We're like here for the show and we're like, we want it to be so real and we want to feel the anticipation and we want to feel the ups and downs and we want to be moved by this show. And if we really knew or thought about the fact that it was orchestrated, that there was a playwright and that there's a director and that there's a cast and that those characters aren't really real characters or just, they're just storylines. It wouldn't be so entertaining. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want, it's almost like we don't want to, to, to mm -hmm. see what's behind the curtain. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Great. That's beautiful. Thank you guys. Thank you for sharing. Uh, this has been awesome. Now is the point of the show where we like to offer a turning stone, and with this week's turning stone, we go to Jesse. The question to practice this week is what does your soul desire to experience in this moment, this moment, and in this moment of time that would have it be fulfilled? And so today's show has been all about questions, questioning, who is God, where is God, what, how does God exist, what is ego, noticing like how all of our cultures, how religion over time has formed us, and the questions that we have had over time that has begun to form our different beliefs, religions, morals and values, things like that. And so the question, the turning stone question really for this week is begin to notice for yourself when you find your stillness and your quiet, noticing all the questions that have always been there, all the answers that have always been there, and see if you can find your own stillness within yourself this week and notice what is your place here in the universe. Who is God for you? Where is God for you? And how do you find, as Barbara was talking about, how do you find those answers inside of the questions that you have? What are your questions? We'd love to hear from you. Uh, again, this week, have an awesome week and begin to listen to that stillness and find your yourself and your soul uh, within each moment of time this week. And remember, this is a show about questions and questioning. It is not a show about answers. Nothing we say here is the truth. It is up to each of us to discover our own truth. Join us each week on The Turning Stone Show as we continue the journey of conversations. Subscribe and get in touch with us. Stay connected and join in the conversation.